Hi, and welcome to this University of California-wide introduction to computational social science. I'm very excited uh, about this course uh, for two reasons. First, uh, computational social science is a really new field. So I myself and we all are uh, just learning about it. it. It wasn't even around when I went to school or to college. So on the go, we are all learning together. And second, knowing about the, that we're all learning together what we did with this course with help of the University of California Office of the President is we went to all 10 UC campuses and we got input and lectures from leading experts that the University of California has from all these 10 campuses. So we all, I, I, I'm learning a lot and I've learned a lot doing this and we are all learning from each other and I'm very happy to have you on board as well because in this very new and exciting field, uh, we're all learning together. Um, what I can promise you in this course is that it is an introduction to the scientific method. We will study ways of how we can create knowledge, how we can systematically create new knowledge, so uh, the scientific method, uh, basically. Uh, and I can promise you that it's going to be a lot of fun uh, doing that. And it's going to be very cool because we have very new cutting edge technologies. And third of all, it's going to be extremely relevant. Uh, right now, of the five most valuable companies, all five of them are basically doing that. They're doing computational social science. But when I went to school, the most valuable companies on planet Earth, uh, they, they were General Electric, General Motors, or, or McDonald's, or, or some petroleum companies, right? Nowadays, the most valuable companies on planet Earth are studying, creating new knowledge about society. They're doing computational social science. So it's not only going to be fun and cool and exciting, uh, it's going to be also extremely relevant. Uh, and it's extremely relevant for all of us and, and for the world, uh, as you can see with that fun figure. All right, uh, so we will start today with looking at that on hand of three questions. The first question is why computational social science? I already started to motivate it a little bit. We can say much more about why uh, computational and why social science now. Uh, that's, uh, both of them are very important and you will see the, the perfect storm is coming together for us to embark on this computational social science uh, mission. Uh, second, what does computational social science cover? So it's basically an introduction to the scientific method that we do here, but we do it with computational tools. And what, what areas are covered? How can we think about doing computational uh, social science? Or what's a, a general framework, which is the framework that we will use throughout this course? And third, what are some examples of computational social science and here I will basically cover what, what, what we will go through in the course, the areas, the, the examples that, that we will pick from computational social science in this course. Now, in general, the idea of doing computational social science uh, is driven by one fundamental fact and that is the digital revolution. The digital revolution happened extremely quickly and profoundly. For example, if we look here at the late 80s, the white part that you see here is the amount of analog information in the world, technologically mediated, stored analog information in the world. And the little green part at the bottom is the amount of digital information in the world. So in the, in the late 80s, 99% of all information that we had as humankind externally stored was in analog format, format, for example, on papers. And then if you can see how that progressed, uh, well, the digital part of information grew, but then after the year 2000, it, it, it just exploded. We estimate that in the year 2002, uh, for the first time, the world was able to store more digital than analog uh, information. We still have papers around, but by now, uh, digital information counts for 
more than 99% of all the information we actually have. Now, when it's in digital format, at the same time, we can also analyze it in the same format, right? So it's digitally stored, we can compute it, and there you already see the idea of computational social science. We just dig into that and see what we can learn about society. Now, that's a whole lot of information we can dig into. The last time I did this estimation was in 2014. That's when I updated it. I did it before for 2007. I don't update it so much because it's it's quite boring to count bits. <laughs> so if anybody wants to help me, happy to update it again. Uh, so in the year 2014, I uh, updated it for the last time. Uh, and, we, uh, and I found that the world was able to store five setabytes. Wow, that's, that, that's, that's a, a number with 21 zeros. How far is five setabytes? Uh, if you would take all this information that you have on your hard disks and your cell phones and, and microchips on the back of your credit card, and you would put this in books, like reading books, and you would make a pile. How high do you think the pile would reach? Would it reach to the moon or to the sun? It would reach 4,500 times to the sun. So there would be 4,500 piles from the earth to the sun with books. That, that's actually, to get to the sun, if you would take your car and you would drive 130 kilometers an hour, that's kind of like this, this, the speed on, on the German Autobahn, which is famously fast, uh, and you would drive day and night without a break, 24 hours, no party break, nothing, not even getting a coffee, you would have to drive for 130 years to get to the sun. You will pass a lot of books you could look into in these 130 years, day and night, driving with high speed on your car. So there's a lot in, in 4,500 times, and this amount of information is doubling every two to three years. So actually, what we're talking right now, it's more like 10,000 and more piles of that that we have uh, available to dig into. Doubling also means that each time we double, we have as much information as we had since prehistory until now, right? So imagine now we're in 2000, let's say we, we would be in two, back in 2014, we have 4,500 piles of books that's all we were able to accumulate during human history. And now we're doubling it. We're adding another 4,500. So we, we store as much new information as all the information we were ever able to. There's a lot of information to dig into. And all the time, you're producing a lot more. And it's in digital format. That means then we can compute it, artificial intelligence, machine learning. We can see new kinds of information that we never saw before. For example, social networks. We will talk a lot about that. And, uh, and we can calibrate our theoretical models much better. We will, we will get to all of that. But that's the first uh, thing I want to leave you with. A lot of information we can dig into about society as well. And society is producing a lot of this information all the time. Uh, even the most ancient things in society are being transformed. For example, the papacy, the, the pope, the Catholic pope, very ancient, thousand-year-old tradition. This up there was the inauguration of the pope in 2005 of Pope Benedict. And this down here only eight years later, in 2013, the inauguration of Pope Francis. There is something changed. What changed? We are all social scientists now. We take pictures all the time. We record social reality all the time. So while we didn't have such a, a complete picture of the inauguration of the Pope in the year, I don't know, 800, now, all of us recording social science activities all the time, with also with our phones, and maybe we even do some computations. We're sharing them, we're getting feedback. We're trying to we record not only, we're trying to analyze that as well and figuring things out. We all have become social scientists. We all do computational uh, social science. And this transformation now, also, if you look at it from a bird's eye view, is really important for the evolution of human history. For example, so I, I told you the world is able to store five setabytes of walls back in 2014, right? Uh, let's put that into this ball. So this is, let's say this is the five setabytes, right? Now, 
life itself also runs from a program. Uh, this program is called DNA and we have it stored in our trillions of cells. So all the trillions of cells that make up my body, I mean, they have different jobs, skin cells, bone cells, blood cells, brain cells called neurons. Uh, but they all inside, they have a little program they run off uh, on, and that's called a DNA. Now let's take the DNA from each one of the trillion cells of my body. They all have a copy of this program. It's a very cool program <laughs> to produce such flexibility and, and, and create all of this, right? So all of the trillion cells, I take each copy, and I take yours as well, and I take the DNA of all humankind in each cell that humankind has. Well, that's a lot of information. Do you think it's more or less than these five setabytes? It's less, we already passed it. It's about one, so it's five times more information that we store digitally as we store in DNA. And, and DNA we don't store much more because, well, we grow as humans, but we grow at, uh, I don't know, at, at zero at 1% or 1 or 2% per year, whereas digital information grows with 30% per year. 25 to 30% a year. So it grows much, much faster. Uh, and that then leads to the uh, idea, so does it have actually an effect on, on evolution? All right, because if life basically runs off information and now this digital information also and artificial intelligence and, and so forth, and, now, and evolutionary theory actually tells us every time something happened in life's history was when there was a major innovation in information processing. For example, if you look at this graph here, when we went from RNA to DNA, so when DNA was invented, that was a, an innovation in how information was processed. Then the DNA went into the cell, and there was a computation program, and then the cell to multicell. So this is called the major transitions of evolution. Every time something significant happened in the evolution of life was when we discovered a new way to process information. For example, in DNA was a big innovation enabled a, a whole new new way of, of doing life, right? And now digital information. Yeah, so uh, it is actually accepted that the digital is the next stage of, of, of evolution of life, of human evolution, right? It can be both ways. Uh, we are creating artificial uh, life with that artificial intelligence and also we use digital to, to sequence our life and, and so forth and the emerging. So this graph actually that you can see here, uh, we published that with two colleagues in the highest ranked journal of evolution and ecology. I, I say that to show you that uh, even the most hardcore evolutionary theorists now take this as a given. Yes, uh, the next stage of evolution is the digital. And the digital then also enables us to understand better society. And we better, because if we're kind of like merging into that, and we already merged into it in our daily life. For example, on the stock market, up to 80% of transactions on the stock market are carried out by artificial intelligence, algorithmic trading. Right? The power grid, our energy resource, I mean energy you cannot store, you have to be very quick. Almost all of it, 99, almost all of it is actually managed by artificial intelligence. This information processor cannot cannot handle so many decisions, which household needs, energy, when and what. So artificial intelligence manages our energy resources. Right? And, and dating as well, uh, the procreation of our species. Uh, between a third and up to a half of marriages produced nowadays are the result of, uh, of artificial intelligence matching our species on online dating platforms. So now if you go to me and say, look, we discovered this new extraterrestrial species. 80% of the distribution of their resources is managed by this other thing. 99% uh, of the distribution of their energy um, and a third of their decision of procreation, well, on average, there might be a procreation in other ways, but yes, that's also probably matched by artificial intelligence. So let's say a third on average of the decisions of procreation, you know, uh, are, are also, you know, mediated by this thing, artificial, digital, whatever you might call it, I would say, well, this, these two systems are one already, 
right? So biological intelligence, artificial intelligence, the digital and the biological are already merged. We are already one with the system. Uh, and that's what this actually talks about, the evolution. And that's why also computational social science is so important because we kind of like use these same digital tools to understand better how society works, kind of like these things, the stock market and so forth, online dating. We can study that much better and understand where our species is going in this moment and where it is going uh, in the future. Now, I have a lot to say about these things and I'm not going to bore you now about how actually the digital revolution changed society because this guy here <laughs> talks a lot about that in another course. There's another course of mine, online course, Digital Technology and Social Change. And they are for 10 sessions, 10 weeks. We talk all about how digital technology changes health, uh, it changes education, it changes entertainment, it political revolutions, and so forth. So uh, you can, I, I will stop there here right now. But it also changes the way knowledge is created. So that's kind of like also my job as a researcher and what we do here at the University of California, uh, we create knowledge, right? Let there be light. That's the motto. We, we shed light uh, on, on, on unknown things uh, and digital technology helps us surely as well to do that. And that's what we'll talk about in this course. And the digital revolution revolutionize the scientific method in all its aspects there. For example, we already talked about empirical work. So, so the digital footprint that we leave behind, for example, when we take pictures and so forth, or, or when we record our digital footprint with our online activities, and we can dig into that and analyze it. But also with regard to theory, we can make powerful computational models about society now. Our computers can hold that and compute that. We kind of like create a digital twin reality where we can simulate society. It's, it's as fun as playing a video game as you can see here and it's as confusing as, as playing a video game sometimes can be. So we do theoretical worlds, we do theoretical models of society and in between of course the analytical. So that bridges those two, the empirical and, and the theoretical. And we're going to do a lot of work with different analysis tools. We use machine learning, artificial intelligence as well to make sense of this data, social network analysis some of the analytical uh, tools that we will cover in this course. And all of that will be brought to you by, as I already said, researchers from all California. So uh, if you start historically with the University of California, it's a little history on the site here. Berkeley was our first campus, right, in 1868. Then UCSF joined. Well, UCSF actually, just to be correct, existed before Berkeley, but it joined the University of California public system uh, five years later in 1873. Then came Davis, that's where I, I, I am here, at the University of California in Davis, which originally was the agricultural school of the University of California and very quickly converted into uh, one of the biggest campuses. Um, UCSB uh, in, in 1909, so expanded to Southern California and after the First World War in 1919, UCLA after the Second World War, 19. 54, Riverside, then joined San Diego, Santa Cruz, Irvine, and our most recent member of the UC family is the campus in UC Merced. So actually I had a lot of fun traveling all around and, and bringing you all these lectures, uh, bringing them together from the leading experts in many of the fields that concern computational social science. And I'm also very grateful to the uh, Office of the President of UC that they helped us uh, financing and sponsoring this and to bring you this powerful collection of knowledge that we have here. Well, I'm looking forward to, to exploring everything together with you. Now, before going deeper into exploring all these cool and fancy computational tool, let's also look at the second part of what computational social science is about, and that is social science. So, so why is it so important, urgent, and relevant to do social science, and why? 
Why now? All right, so let's take uh, a little historical context for that. Warren Weaver, which was a big advocate of science uh, in the last century, in, in, in 1948, so in the 1950s, he wrote uh, an influential article about, this, about science and complexity. And he basically said, well, there are three kinds of problems that we have been working on in the, in the entire history of science. At the beginning, we started out with tackling what he called problems of simplicity. So science before 1900, he said, was largely concerned with two variable problems. So for example, in physics, temperature and pressure, or in social science, uh, population and time how population changed over time, right? Or production and trade. And there are, are these formulas that, you know, we look at in high school and it's just like one variable and another variable. And then we see, but it's pretty simple. It's like two variable problems, maybe sometimes even three variable problems, but they are, they are pretty simple, keeping it to a small number of, of involved variables that we look at and how they relate. Then he said, we tackled problems of, of averages, basically. So sub subsequent to 1900, scientists developed powerful techniques of probability theory to deal with a problem in which the number of variables is very large and one in which each of the many variables have a behavior, behavior which, is, which is perhaps totally unknown. So for example, a, a, billiard balls and air molecules and in thermodynamics, so all kind of averages. So the, the, the behavior of the individual is then unknown, but we can work with averages. And we do that in social science a lot through the law of large numbers. So once we have large numbers, we can disregard the details of each individual members of this large number, and we get these nice distributions, for example, around an average, and we work with these distributions. So uh, for example, we know know that the height of people is mainly average. People have mainly an average height. There are very few people who, who are extremely tall and very few people who are extremely small, but on average, you know, they, it's, it's normal, and that's why this is called the normal distribution, the bell curve. Um, on average, most people kind of like fall under uh, these, uh, these, these, these distribution of heights, and, and we can just work with this distribution now. We don't have to consider the individuals and all kind of statistical analysis, correlation, regressions, and so forth is based on this, what we could call science of averages, right? And it requires some assumptions on how we fit it to these, to these distributions. So that came then in the 20th century. And then Weaver said, there are problems of, of complexity, of organized complexity, dealing simultaneously with a sizable number of factors, which are interrelated into an organic whole uh, problems in the economic and political sciences cannot be handled with the statistical techniques so effective in describing average behavior. These new problems and the future of, of the world depends on many of them, require science to make a third great advance, an advance that must be even greater than the 19th century conquest of problems of simplicity and the 20th century victory over problems of, of disorganized complexity, which is this averages. So he said, science must, over the next 50 years, learn to deal with these kind of problems, because the future in the world depends on many of them. Well, he said that in 1950, right? So more than 70 years ago. Uh, but Weaver, hold on, we are getting to it. We are getting to it with computational science. We are starting to tackle, we, we might have been a little behind the schedule he gave us, but now we are starting to get to these problems, these complex problems. And he actually also predicted that. He said, uh, the wartime development of new type of electronic computing devices <laughs> will have a tremendous impact on science. Mm. They will make it possible to deal with problems which previously were too complicated. Uh, and more importantly, they will justify and inspire the development of new methods of analysis applicable to these new problems. And that's what we are talking about. So this computational science approach comes out because of this, you know, wartime development of electronic devices, which nowadays we call computer telecommunication databases and so forth. And they allow us to develop new methods. And that's what computational science, in our case, computational social science is about. And Weaver said that's especially applicable to problems in the social sciences. 
because these are problems, many of them don't fit. Th these are not simple. We don't only have one or two or three variables. B but they are also not, it's not often easy to build averages because there's a lot of diversity and interdependency. Averages often assumes that, that the things are independent. People are interdependent. They're not all the same. They are, but they're also not completely different. They are somehow different and somehow connected. It's not like we're all connected. We are some connected. It's really, it's a complex thing. Actually, the social sciences, if we go to the pyramid of sciences, is the most complex of all sciences. So maybe start with what was you know, the, the, the original science, uh, you know, back in the days, hundreds of years ago, it was, you know, philosophy or physics. So that's, that's basically what it was. It was humanities or physics that was, that was science. And physics, yes, the fundamental one. It, it talks about particles, the universe, uh, matter, and, and, and how matter actually organizes uh, and is structured. And, and, and how the dynamics of matter happen. Now, uh, if we take a bunch of particles and put them together, uh, what we can create is a higher level, for example, atoms and molecules. So there we go to chemistry. So chemistry is the connection, is already a network out of these well, atoms, and, and, and these are molecules. Now these molecules can form macromolecules, and macromolecules, like for example, DNA, uh, are the basis of higher forms of organization, for example, cells. And cells with a bunch of macromolecules, then, you know, the cell is an entire little city, a lot of things going on. There's kind of like a power production center in there, a freeway communication center, a transport system, a waste disposal system. So in these cells now, these cells then on higher levels create entire organisms, multicellular organism. These are connections of cells, and that's why biology has different levels as well within biology. And one kind of multicellular organism that we can create is the human. So now we have the human made out of trillions of cells in my body, and the social is actually the network among different humans. So we have a network among different humans. So it's actually one higher level. We don't look at one individual human here. We look at a whole of human and, and this from a bird's eye view that's what we call the social and actually it gets even it gets even more complex because nowadays we have another layer of it we have technology in there so it's actually a socio-technological system that we have here a, a big part of the day you're not communicating with another biological information processor you communicate with an artificial intelligence you communicate with a database. If you just go on the internet, most of the a, lot, a big part of the communication you do there, maybe not for everybody most, but a big part is you Google, for example, uh, you look for information, you communicate with a platform that intermediates uh, uh, different pieces of information. And so uh, technology has become an intricate part of the socio-technological whole. Now, all of that going down again, society, of course, is based on humans and humans are multicellular organisms and that is based on cells and that is based on molecules and that is based on particles, so all the way down. And in each one of these levels, a different level of emergence happens. So there are really different rules on each one of these levels. I mean, chemistry is not applied physics. And biology is not applied chemistry, and the social social science is not applied biology. Yes, there are some things it, 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 it influences certainly, but on each level of these, that's why we structure science like this. And this is this course is also an, an introduction to science. That we structure science like this, and each level of them, new laws emerge, and we can study them, and you can specialize just on this level of emergence and study these kind of laws. You don't, the interesting thing is you don't really have to know all of the details of the lower level. Sometimes it might help, but sometimes really they are not really related. There might be some principles that apply to all of them and so forth. But you can see that actually the socio-technological system is based on them and that makes it extremely complex. There are a lot of moving parts going around that we actually have to consider and that makes it so difficult also to make predictions in the social sciences. Right. Which is one of the reasons that some researchers from the natural sciences used to say that the social science is not really a science. It's more like art, right? In the university of the art and the sciences, because in the social sciences, we weren't able to make a lot of predictions. If we could predict like 20% of a variance of something, you would publish in the highest journals. 
in the social sciences, in physicists and biologists, was he like, well, that's not, we can, we can make predictions with much higher accuracies, right? You guys are not a science, you're basically an art, but now, as we will also see, with the computational social science, we are really converting the social studies into a science. We are able to make predictions of 85, 95% accuracy with what happens if we take this bird eye view and look at society as a whole. So that's why it's, well, it's called computational social science. Let's look a little bit deeper into this highest level of, of emergence in this, in this pyramid, social emergence. How can we think of that? So I said the social science is more like studying one human, right? It's, it's, it's not individual psychology, for example. It's, it's the social. So we look at an aggregate. How can we think about this aggregate? Well, this aggregate actually has kind of like its own behaviors. It has its own laws that it functions by, and as social scientists, we take this bird-eyed view and we look at this super organism that we call society or societies, and different social scientists look at different aspects of it. Some might study how this super organism nurtures its needs. Its, its demands and how it supplies for its demands. These are called economists. Uh, others see, for example, how this superorganism governs itself, right? What's well, kind of like the governance structure, political scientists, for example. Other look at kind of like the quirks, anthropologists, sociologists, look at how the quirks, how it behaves, what it actually does, how it actually works inside uh, these behavioral patterns. And, and, and we study this from a bird's eye view. And, and this is this idea of social emergence. To give an idea because social science science is a little bit uh, it's difficult to think about it because we are part of it. Think about an ant colony. So an ant colony is basically a social structure. This here is an example taken from, from one of my favorite books called Gödel, Escher and Bach. I highly recommend it if you're interested in, in reading something on the side. Gödel is the biggest logician, uh, basically, that we had. Uh, Escher is an artist, a painter, uh, and Bach the, music the musician, uh, uh, Johann Sebastian Bach. Right. And it's a very beautiful book how it combines together. So uh, what Hofstetter uh, explains in this book is an example of an ant colony and the ant eater, the animal, the ant eater, basically communicates with the ant colony. So the ant eater calls the ant colony uh, he calls the ant colony Aunt Hillary. <laughs> well, pun intended, so it's an, an, an ant colony that lives on a hill. So Aunt Hillary, for him, is like one being. Now, the ant colony actually consists of individual ants. But for the ant eater, it's kind of like a dialogue with, not with the individual ants, but with the ant colony. And the ant colony sometimes extends to the ant eater, gives him some parts she wants to get rid of. So Aunt Hillary says, well, can you lick here? I want to get rid of these ants. Uh, and the ant, they have a symbiosis. They live together. They actually help each other out, right? So at one point, the ant eater says, well, all the ants in Aunt Hillary are as dumb as can be. But they are teams on higher levels whose members are not ants, but teams on lower levels. The thoughts, the thoughts in Aunt Hillary emerge from the manipulation of symbols composed of signals, composed of teams, composed of lower level teams, all the way down to ants. And as a result of this emergence of these different levels of teams within teams, within structures from ants, there's on a high level called this, this emergent phenomena called Aunt Hillary is actually one. Like if you look at it, you think like, well, what does Aunt Hillary think? And how does she think? Well, these are the structures of the different ants, and that's what the ant eater discusses. So that's how you can think about that society. A society emerges from individuals and different kinds of organization with different motivations that we study in different well, social science disciplines. But that's what we take. We take a bird's eye view. Uh, Right. And actually, uh, the, the, the total of that is often much more powerful than even the sum of the parts. So, for example, here I give you another example from biology. Where you can, it's easier to imagine it with biology. Look at that. That's a flock of starlings, basically, trying to fight a falcon. So the falcon, a much more powerful bird, is attacking the starlings. And the starlings go into a social formation in order to confuse and intimidate uh, this falcon. So have a look at this little video. In the social sciences, therefore, it's, it's quite intuitive that this idea of social emergence is at the heart of all the social sciences, right? So that's, that's what we're trying to figure out. That's what we're trying to understand when we do, especially we being kind of the ants, being part of, 
of this higher formation, you're trying to figure out what this actually this higher formation is all about, right? Trying to take a bird's eye view of something that we ourselves are part of, which is an interesting, very complex, complex problem. But if you think about all the big scientists and influence, uh, influential thinkers have actually pointed to that, that's, that's the major problems. For example, let's start with philosophy. So originally all scientists were philosophers, right? Um, Immanuel Kant, the big Immanuel Kant, he was fascinated by the problem again as well. He said, for example, it seems like marriages, for example, and Kant is the, the philosopher of the free will. He said marriages, birth and death, are not subject to any rule since the free will has large influence on them. So that was his thing, right? The free will, and it, it's your free will who you want to marry, for example. Uh, still, the annual tables of the large countries show continuous preservation. So that's kind of like, that baffled him. How can it be that we all have a free will? But then if you just look at the bird's eye view, you can actually make predictions on a higher level of how many people will get married here or there. And on this higher level, we can then look for laws, rules, patterns, and do social science. Uh, sociology as well, Durkheim, the founder of one of the founding fathers of sociology, he was fascinated with that. One of his most influential books was on suicide. You know, suicide, that's kind of like the last free will decision you can take. You basically take the free will decision to take yourself out. Now, he was also fascinated with the idea that actually you could predict how many people would commit suicide in this city next month? So, and it's not like an individual would say like, oh, wait, we're not going to comply the statistics. I better commit suicide on Tuesday and not on Thursday. So in order, no, <laughs> it's, it's an accumulation of free will. But still, if you take a bird's eye view from society, there are very stable patterns, which he called a, a, a collective current. Uh, and each of them contains, each of us contains only a spark of this collective current. The same economics, of course, Adam Smith and his invisible hand. So literally he said, he, the individual, intends, uh, intends only his own gain. So we are really egoistic. We only intend our own gain. And he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which has no part of his intention. We're not trying to be good to society. Right? By pursuing his own interests, his own egoistic interest, he frequently promotes that of society, the global interest, more effectively than when he really intends to promote it. <laughs> so that's the it's kind of like it was really perplexing and made Adam Smith quite famous, this observation, right? We are all egoistic pursuing our own interests, but then all together on a higher level, it's not like society, it, it promotes the good for everybody, right? Market mechanisms. And uh, so that's, again, it shows you on a higher level, there are different kind of laws that we can study in economics actually studies that. It studies on a higher level, these social, these social structures. Uh, what else do we have? Oh, political science. Political science, another social science discipline. Rousseau, so Rousseau uh, famously made the point that the individual will, like my will, my individual volonté particulier and your individual will, your volonté particulier, if we sum them up, we get the total will. So we call it volonté de two. So I want to drive fast on the freeway. You want to drive fast on the freeway. So if we sum that up, let's have no speed limit on freeways. But then Rousseau said, well, well, actually, that's not how it works. Because if you really think about that, then I think about what? Together with us, both on the freeway, it's more like, oh, no, that's, that's very dangerous. Let's have a speed limit. So what we want, what he called volonté général, the general will, is different from what I want plus what you want. So the volonté général is different than the volonté de two. The, the general will is different than the total will. If you just sum up the individual wills, we might get to one conclusion. But if you really think about it, you know, we want something different. What we want is different than from what I want and plus what you want. Uh, and this is because of the interactions. On a higher level, there are interactions, and we have to consider these interactions, and we will model them as well in this course. These kind of interactions, we will look at networks, at, at computer simulations, at, at digital footprints that help us to see these interactions, and then see on a higher level actually what emerges. And that's what we're interested in in social science, also making this difference, what emerges on a higher level. 
All right, what else do we have? We have philosophy, sociology, economics, political science. Oh, oh, this gentleman here. Everybody says he is theirs, right? Sociologist, economics, political. He was like in all of the social science discipline. Very deep thinker independent from his political ambitions as a social scientist, profoundly deep thinker. And, and what Karl Marx observed was that at one point, merely, merely quantitative differences, so you keep on pushing, keep on pushing, keep on pushing with something, you make it bigger, 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 beyond a certain point pass into qualitative changes. So that's the definition of emergence. Something is qualitatively different after a certain point. More of the same is not going to continue just be more of the same, it's, it's really different. So that's, that's called the metaphysical uh, principle of dialectics, but basically it says this idea of social emergence. So that's what we are interested in studying, right, in society. A and therefore we need some, some really powerful techniques in, in order to do so. Because society is not, and that's, that's the usual case, how we would say society works, it's an IID now, uh, identi independent, identity distributed individuals we are not. Society rather looks like this. It's a very complex, interdependent, uh, medium diversity. We are all not completely different, but uh, we are all also not, not the same. Some, of, some things are different, some things are the same. We are also not all completely connected. Some are connected, but not to others. It's like this interesting in between where we are. We cannot go with the averages, just going like there's a bunch of individuals. We make averages because the interdependency is often among us. We cannot also go only with few because there are many variables that actually influence all of that that you see here. And therefore, yes, we need to make this third big advance, as Beaver would say, and computational tools help us a lot to understand and to tame better this, this complexity in social emergence. What does computational social science uh, cover? How does it fit in within the broader picture then of the scientific method and, and of scientific uh, method, method especially applied to, to the social sciences? Well, the scientific method basically is, is based on three legs. That's how you can broadly think about it. The first is empirical. We, make, we observe reality. We make observations. We collect data. We just, or we just look out, an ethnographer just looks and tries to make observations, right? So that's empirical, we look at reality. The other one, kind of like the other extreme, is the world of thoughts, is theoretical. There, we can make up worlds that don't even exist in empirical reality, but in theory, we want the world to be a better place. So we make theories about societies that don't even exist, that we don't even can observe. And the one in between, kind of like the overlap, is what we call analytical. So let's look at some of the most famous influential scientists, for example, empirical. Darwin, Charles Darwin, uh, with evolution, he, he started with empirical evidence. So he went on this ship called the Beagle, and for five years he basically was on the ship making observations. Uh, a lot in South America. He famously went to the Galapagos Islands and saw that finches on different islands have peaks with different length. Uh, he saw a lot of fossil evidence, kind of like fossil evidence from the ocean in the mountains, and he thought about like how long that must have taken. And, and with this empirical evidence, then he got it all together and wrote these big books, these big books that basically uh, tr tried to convince people based on a lot of observations that he made. Now, the mathematical theory of evolution uh, was developed later, significantly later, some, some 30, 40 years later. Other people got together and really distilled all these big books into some very neat equations that actually show you how concisely you can think about the survival of the fittest and how actually evolution works. So me as a social scientist, when I work with evolutionary theory, uh, I just use these equations. And then I see how social systems evolve over time. I don't go back to the finches and the empirical evidence. You kind of like distilled a theory out of all this empirical evidence that Darwin so painstakingly collected over his lifetime. So the other way around, another very influential scientist would be Einstein. So Einstein went on that from the other way around, right? So he just started out with theory. He didn't really look at reality so much. He just said, well, there were a few observations that were known at the time. So for example, Einstein said, so, so guys, if, if you really say 
that the speed of light is always constant, that light travels with a constant speed. Guys, if you say that, the speed is, I don't know, miles per hour, right? That's the speed. So there's, there's miles, space, and there's time per hour, right? So there's, there's space and time, then something has to happen to space time. And so he, he took the train, he, he rode it through, he derived from that that actually it must be a space-time continuum, that it must curve and so forth, The time is just another dimension of space, it's just the fourth dimension, and he just rode this train all the way through. And then he said, well, if, if that first thing is correct, all this other stuff has to be correct too. And that's the theory of relativity. Now when Einstein published that, it's not like people said like, whoa, what a genius insight, they're just like, oh, well, that's just one idea. We don't know if that's correct or not. That's just this idea of this young guy which actually worked in a patent office. So he wasn't even a professor or something. And then it took some years later that they empirically proved that he was correct. So experimentalists, Einstein being a theoretical physicist, experimental physicists then came. And years later, the, the, the more concrete proofs, again, 50 years later, then actually showed that Einstein was correct. And only that made him instantly famous. He wasn't famous before that. Uh, people had, in, in 1919, there was one of the first proofs and people had to wait for a solar eclipse and went down to Brazil and Africa to look at the solar eclipse. And with that could then prove that that Einstein's theory is actually correct, and only that then made him famous. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, one of the assistants, assistants of Einstein uh, once then asked him uh, what, he, what his reaction would have been if these empirical tests from Brazil and, and from Africa, if they would not have confirmed his theory. <laughs> and Einstein famously said, well, then I would have felt very sorry for the dear Lord because the theory is correct, right? So, wow. Okay, so he was so convinced of his theory that actually, but we needed the empirical proof to really see like, okay, he believed in it, but all of us were only convinced once we saw this empirical proof. So it went from theory to, to, to empirical, where, where uh, Darwin went from empirical to theory. So these are the two ways we can think about that. In general, if you now translate it to methods, what Einstein did is kind of like work with a problem with a few variables. So E is mc squared. It has this very few variables. And it's, you can think about it as math how the relation is between E energy and the mass and the speed of light and E is mc squared. Okay, three variable problem. Problem of simplicity. And the other one is kind of like statistics, stats. So we have a lot of variables. Darwin collected a lot of evidence, but then he kind of like what he did mentally was kind of like curve fitting. <laughs> Nowadays we do that with machine learning. We have a lot of data points and we try to see like, well, what are some patterns? What are some things? And Darwin did the same thing. Well, mentally, it's like, well, what do the finches in Galapagos have in common with, with this uh, fossil evidence in the mountains, and, and how does it actually all, all fit together? And then from this evidence, he derived some general tendency, which was his ideas about, about evolution. So you can think about it math and, and stats. Now, when we do computational approaches, especially computational social science as well, we basically all cover all of the three fields. So empirical evidence, we often get from our, it's called big data from the digital footprint, we often get it. The digital footprint that we leave behind with every digital step we take. So when you're on the internet, when you walk around with your mobile phone, you leave a digital trace behind. And when we often use that in order to do social science. And that tells us, well, what happened? You record in real time what happened in your social interaction, in your mobility, and so forth. Then the theoretical part of it is we can simulate it. So independent from the empirical observations, we can just create new, new social systems. Here, for example, I created a city. And uh, here we explore why it happened. So we see something, we are not sure why, so we create many theoretical worlds and kind of like then can test, well, why did it happen like it happened? So that's an interesting theoretical question. It explains us the why, not, not the what, but then we try in theory, what's the why? And the one in between, the analytical is, well, how it happened. So there we go. And so in, in, in computational, social science also covers all of, of these aspects of, of the social sciences. So let us go a little bit, a little bit more formal about this idea that I just presented, digging, digging a little bit deeper in. So okay, we have Darwin. Darwin started with his observation of a phenomenon of a system. From that, he collected data. He collected it 
just by observation, but you can also ask questions or, or build the data so you can make a survey uh, or you can even simulate data and, 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 get, so, and get the data in that, that way, do an experiment. You just collect data in some shape or form. And from that then you abstract a model for example, in modern days, it would be machine learning, curve fitting, you make a regression model, you try to fit a line or a curve to your data points. You see, like, what's the tendency? Does it go up? Does it go down? Can I describe it a little bit more succinctly, right? I, I want to abstract all these data points. We cannot make sense of them, so I want to break it down and have a model, an abstraction of reality that's easy, that makes it easier to think and makes it easier also to extrapolate maybe, make predictions with it. Then you have your hypothesis, it's kind of like your style effect, and then you test your hypothesis at the end and you create your theory. So you can reject the hypothesis uh, or you cannot reject your hypothesis and what you do with hypothesis testing is you try to see if the model that you have is just, the data that you have is just random, often that's what you try to do, or if there's a little bit something more to it. If it's not just a random thing, but if there's something really, a mechanism that really created this data, and that's the mechanism you then theorize about. So this goes from the phenomena all the way over to theory. Uh, formally, this is called induction. You induce. So you induce, you go from data to theory. So in, in, in cases where data is abundant, abundantly available um, and good theory is hard to come by, then you usually do induction, which you often do in computational social science too because with a digital footprint, we have big, big data. So we often have a lot of data. These companies, these big companies, Google, Facebook, Apple, and so forth, they then throw machine learning at it, Amazon, they throw machine learning at it, and with that, well, they come up with different models which then help them to predict, for example, consumer behavior. Now, Einstein went, went the other way around. So Einstein started with the theory, and from that he formulated some hypothesis. He actually already delivered the hypothesis. He said, well, if my theory is correct, this and this and this and this must hold true if you guys test it. I don't, I don't have time for the testing. I'm already convinced they don't even need to test it. But if any of these things fail, the entire theory is out of the window. He was also so strong about it. He says, like, all of that will hold. I bet, I bet you all of it will hold. So an hypothesis is basically, you can, if you hear the word hypothesis, you can replace it with the word bet. It's a bet. I bet you, and you actually also formulate the direction of it. So I bet you that it will be like this. And then you can lose the bets. That means you can reject the hypothesis. So that's actually what hypothesis is. You can replace it with the word bets. Um, interestingly enough, we can never prove an hypothesis. We can only disprove it. So you can only lose lose bets. So that's, that's the idea of hypothesis. Einstein formulated these hypotheses and said, if any of these will be rejected, all of the entire thing must fail, but I'm sure all of it will hold. I'm convinced, so I don't even have to check it out. You guys go and check it out. I, I have other things to do now. I want to continue looking for the world formula that he famously looked for uh, until, until he passed on. So he formulated this hypothesis, then other people came up with some models, they made some models, some abstractions, they came up with the idea, well, the solar eclipse and so forth, so that's how we can abstract it, that's how we can test it, then they went down to Brazil and to Africa and collected this data during the solar eclipse, and with this then, well, they confirmed the phenomena, the, the, the theory of, of relativity. So Einstein went this way around, this is called deduction. So you deduce from theory to data. Well, so if thought is abundantly available, maybe we have a lot of Einsteins, right, and good data is, is, is scarce to come by, so you have to wait for a solar eclipse, and then you go, you go rather this way. And also in, in computational social science nowadays, we have a lot of theories because we can simulate them. We do computer simulations. We have a lot of competing theories, which we then can test the data. So often we also go this other way around. We often go from theory then to data. We can do both of it together. So now if we reorganize that a little bit, and in this class we will reorganize it to see a, a more modern approach to it. We only not only do induction and deduction, that's how it was traditionally taught but the truth is you can go through that in many, many different ways. So it's more like you think about it, but it's a circle of different components that you, it's a choice of the researcher, how you will walk through this, through this maze from one, from one end to the other. Some are more recommended than others. 
Uh, but actually, well, the sky is the limit here. All right, so let's go through the circle a la Darwin, just, just for us to make sure that we are still, still have the same uh, circle, so induction. Darwin started in observing the phenomena, collected a bunch of data, then abstracted from the data to develop some hypothesis, for example, the survival of the fittest, Right, and then from that on, some other people developed the mathematical theory that the survival of the fittest, therefore the equation says one survives, the other doesn't. And that's actually the theoretical framework now of evolutionary dynamics, which is applied not only in biology and ecology, but to social sciences, uh, stock markets, and so forth. So, doing induction in that way uh, in a computational world has some benefits. One of the benefits is that we start with data, as you can see here, and we have a lot of data. And that's also one of the problems. So first I'm gonna walk you through the benefits and then I'll show you some of the problems that we have with this traditional approach of induction. Well, on the one hand, we have a lot of data around now, the digital footprint, uh, much more data than we had before. So uh, before I joined academia, uh, I, I was working at the United Nations Secretariat for 15 years. I was a, you know, I had lifelong, I was quite, it was a quite a successful career actually. I had lifelong status um, and uh, at the United Nations you can have a lot of influence uh, on, on international policy making. But one of the things I, I, I wasn't so, so happy with is the lack of data and back then we didn't have a lot of data around. So for example, one initiative uh, I was involved in actually that I led and coordinated was a digital development plan for Latin America and the Caribbean. So I worked for the United Nations Secretariat for Latin America and the Caribbean and all the countries of the region got together and we brought them together to develop a digital development plan. One of the goals in this plan refer to public access, public internet access, because you know, having computers in your houses is very expensive, especially for low income countries. So the policymakers got together and negotiated. They wanted to push public access in cyber cafes and libraries and so forth. And the question is, what should be the goal of that? Well, night long negotiations, you know, secretaries of state and internet and, and uh, science and technology ministers and secretaries discussing uh, into the night and at the end they came up with this magical number. We want to achieve in the next two years 20, 000, an average of 20,000 people per center. So we want to reduce it and get to that, to that magical number. The plan was approved in 2005 and in 2007 that should be the new standard. Uh, how they came up with this number? Well, I wrote the first version of this plan. I don't remember what number I put in, but then uh, governments discussed, but the truth is they, they didn't really have a lot of data to base this decision on. They called the capital and the capital tell them, you know, uh, tell them back there in, in, in the administration, well, no, that's too much, it's a little, but the truth is afterwards, uh, I, went, I went back to my office and together with a consultant, we just took an inventory. And we discovered that the countries of the region had already passed this goal 10 times at the moment that it was approved, right? There were already one access center per 2,000 people, not 20,000 people. So this shows you that actually their policy was, was based on, on nothing. So if we go the circle of science all the way through from making observations to developing theory in order to then influence policy, well, if we don't have the data, well, everything is based on sand. So nowadays with the digital footprint, of course, the promise is, oh, we have a lot of data. We have big data in theory now. For example, we could collaborate with, with telecom providers and look for the digital footprint, which are access center and have a real time monitoring of how many public as Yeah, in theory, that's great. And in practice, that's a big promise. The promise that we have much more data, we can do much more induction nowadays. What, some of the, what is one of the problem of doing so much induction? Well, the problem is that if we go back to Darwin's circle, actually, that we often skip the first and go directly to the second step, and that's data. So we often go directly to the data, and, and interestingly enough, often we don't have data that really fits to our phenomena. So if we work with a digital footprint, for example, uh, it's just an approximation, it's a footprint. It's not the foot. 
So the data really doesn't reflect the phenomena, but since we have so much data nowadays, you know, it's, a, it's an information, informational overload that we have, uh, we just work with what we have. The analogy here that people often use to explain this pitfall has to do with the infamous, notorious drunk who, who comes out of the bar and then looks for, looks for his house keys. And uh, the police officer finds the guy like, searching there on the floor. He's like, what are you doing? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for my keys. I lost my keys. I don't know where my keys are. And he said, well, uh, let's think about uh, where did you lose them? And he said, well, uh, uh, over there. It's like, so why are you here looking for your keys? Well, officer, because here is light, right? He's under the lamppost. So <laughs> he's under the lamppost searching just not because that's where it's really interesting, not because that's where he lost his keys, just because there is light where he can search. And often, so that's what I'm trying to say, is often we just use data because data is there, even so it's just a very rough approximation uh, to actually where's the really interesting thing which often is hidden in the darkness. So I'm gonna bore you with another example of my, of my time uh, as an economic affairs officer. One of, the, one of the jobs that I did then as well is uh, to do technical assistance with, with countries and help them to develop their national uh, development strategy uh, for, digital, for, for digital development. And uh, one, uh, one time I, I, I did a consultancy, a uh, technical assistance in a Caribbean island. Yes, I know. I always told my boss we have to help the Caribbean islands much more. And he, he didn't want to send me there enough. But at that time, I spent about a month in those Caribbean islands. I worked with the government to develop a, a digital development uh, agenda. And we interviewed different agencies uh, in this, uh, on the island, uh, chambers of commerce as well, and they gave us interesting input. One input, for example, they said is we should use digital tools for disaster management. So in a Caribbean island, that's, that's a survival, essential survival thing to have a, 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 dis, a disaster strategy. So they said, well, with digital pre-warning systems, okay, so that's great. So one chapter of the agenda, uh, the proposal of the agenda was digital uh, disaster management. We went around, somebody else said, uh, the business people said, well, we are very close to the United States. We live in the same time zone and actually uh, we all speak English here. So we should develop some call centers and outsource, do a software industry where, where United States, companies from the United States can outsource uh, their, their jobs to, just like other countries like India has been very successful in that. So they said, well, let's develop a software service industry in order to get part of that pie. Also very interesting proposal. So all these, we, we developed all these proposals, all these different chapters uh, in, the, uh, in the first draft of the agenda. And then I had to go elsewhere. I went to another country and did something similar. And a few weeks later, I called back and I asked the, the person from the science and technology ministry, whatever happened to our plan? And he said, well, nothing. Shortly after I left, the minister of finance came back and, and the Minister of Finance was at the World Economic Forum. That's a big forum where, where global leaders from the private and public sector meet. And uh, he went there and he was furious, furious when he came back because they presented a ranking of digital preparedness, digital readiness. And it turns out that the neighboring island was ahead of them in this ranking. So he came back and was like, don't we have people who work on that? How can that be that we are lower ranked than they, than they are? And next year, I want us to be extremely highly ranked. We have to, we have to be better than they. And, and so he basically took all the money that was allocated, he's the Minister of Finance, he took all the money that was allocated for this digital development plan and put it into something that would help to booster their ranking. One of the indicators they used in this ranking was how many computers are there in households. Now, that's an interesting uh, indicator. It, it doesn't help too much for digital development as a nation because you can, with computers and households, you can do a lot of things. Not all of them help to increase productivity and so forth. Some of them do, some of them maybe less. So it's questionable if the money is better spent on, on you know, a software industry than to subsidize computers for households, but that's what they did. They cashed all the money, subsidized computers and households. Next time the guys came and measured, oh, they had a lot of computers and households. So in this ranking, they went, uh, they, they went ahead. But actually what happened here is 
it's kind of like you put the, 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 the cart in front of the horse, right? Just because it was measured like this. And why was it measured like this? Why was the ranking of the World Economic Forum using this indicator? Well, because there was light. This indicator existed. It's not that this is the most important indicator for digital development, but it's kind of like, you know, looking under the lamppost. At least we have this indicator, so let's just use it. And then countries started to try to game the index by trying to go with the index. So it's completely, you know, upside down as it should be. So that's a severe danger of going with that approach, especially also in the social sciences, because often we don't have data for what we're exactly looking for, especially if you work with, with big data, with the digital footprint. And we always have to be aware that it's a footprint, not a foot. Now let's do deduction. Traditionally induction one way, deduction the other way. So we take our circle, we start with Einstein here with deduction from our theory to hypothesis, hypothesis to abstraction, some models, then we have to collect some data in order to go to the phenomena we're actually interested in and then we are convinced, right? So that's what we did before, is just now this way around going through the circle. Now if we do traditional deduction, there are also problems with it. For example, applied to the social sciences. So the smallest unit of the social, social sciences is actually a pair, right? A pair and, and couples, particular, for example, marriages, pairs that stay together for a long time are very important units if you want to go to the level of abstraction of society. Now, in the 1970s, the prevailing theory of why marriages would fail, the theory that they had, was that actually couples didn't express enough of their anger and resentment toward each other. So the therapy, therefore, about going forward, you know, policy intervention, uh, strategy, how to help these couples would be well. They they would get together in therapy and they would express their resentment. And actually, in this in this one therapy, they would get some rubber foam bats and actually they would whack each other, right, expressing their resentment. So she would say something like. Um, I resent that you don't help enough with the dishes. And then she would, you know, whack him over the head, right? And, and then he would say, well, and I resent that we don't have enough sex. And, and then he would, you know, whack. Like, really, that was the state of, of couples therapies in the 70s and, and coming from this theory that couples don't express enough resentment to each other. Now, this guy came along, Dr. John Gottman, one of the 10 most influential uh, psychologists nowadays, and he created this love lab where he collected data. So he said, we don't start only with the theory. Remember, Einstein just started with the theory. He said, well, we need a little bit, we need a little bit more data of it. So uh, he then actually created what he called the love lab. He had in Seattle this nice little apartment, and he would invite couples in to spend the weekend in this apartment. Condition was that during the day, not at night, but during the day, cameras would be running to monitor them, right? So you collect a lot of big data nowadays, to actually a footprint of what they were doing, and they also connected them, they did uh, tests with electrodes of their heart rates, for example, in the next room were people who were analyzing them, basically a big brother house. And he collected lots and lots and lots of data uh, from thousands of couples. Then he distilled it down to actually five telltale signs only five signs, five characteristics, five variables. And with that, he's able to predict with 94% accuracy if this couple would get divorced in the next four years. 94% accuracy, that is science, right? As I usually we predict things at the level of 20%. You know, if we explain 20, 30% of the variance, the biggest journal you can choose, please go ahead and publish. 94% accuracy just with five things you have to pay attention to in a marriage. Now he said, if you would not change them, if you would work on these five things and have a lifelong marriage. So basically, you know, with this data, he basically, he kind of like solved, he solved the problem of couples. Well, he didn't solve it in a, in a way that, that uh, well, we know what these signs are now. So scientifically, theoretically, we've solved it, but we usually don't implement it, right? We still have a very high divorce rate. So even so we know what to do, we usually don't do it. So it's kind of like you imagine you play tic-tac-toe. Right? If you really concentrate, you know, there are nine fields in tic-tac-toe, you can always tie. You never have to lose in tic-tac-toe. I mean, it's a child's game. If you, really, you can always tie that game, uh, independent of who starts. But it's more like in marriages, we are more like, you know, we're just winging it. We don't pay attention to what we know. 
We don't pay attention to the algorithm that actually could solve it. We just, and then, you know, we mess up. <laughs> we just don't want to, or, or maybe it's not the condition that we wanted. And because we expect it for it to go by itself. But if you take a scientific approach, well, 94% accuracy, that's pretty much solved. And he can predict that af only after listening 15 minutes to a couple talking. Then he can predict it already. So it's not the big things. It's the small little things where he deduces it from. So there is a, a now an, an, an expressing resentment and anger is absolutely not one of them. He actually found that's completely counterproductive. It's very negative. Uh, so completely turned this theory upside down uh, with data. So it's very important that we then also collect data. So what are some other ways we can go through it? I said, well, there's induction, there's deduction, but there are problems with it, especially if you do, if you do social sciences. What another way, actually the most common way we do social sciences in, in, in most social science fields, especially also in communication where, where, where I am researching, is we verbally deduce hypotheses by examining the logical interrelationships among the verbal statements offered by the theory. Monjin Contractor, two of my mentors, explained that in, 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 the network, in the network theory book. So what does it mean? We verbally deduce hypotheses. So verbally. We just look at the logical interrelationships among some verbal statements offered by some theory, and we like then verbally we look at that and we kind of like, hmm, I think like, okay, I think like, well, that would be a good hypothesis to test. I would bet, I would bet that this is, that's how it is. So it doesn't come from any formal framework. You know, we just have a phenomena that we observe and then we have some theory. So we deduce it like this. <laughs> I started to call this kind of like glass of red wine theorizing, because it's kind of like you have a glass of red wine, you know, on a Sunday evening, you kind of like, you think about it, like, I think it's actually, and then we deduce some kind of theory. I actually found this, this, this interesting wine in Napa Valley, no promotion, I never tried it. <laughs> it's called hypothesis, which I, which I found very, very funny. So yes, it's, that's how you can think about it, right? So the glass of red wine, and then we come up with some kind of theory. And this theory then develops some kind of hypothesis, which we think like verbally deduced, the logical, and I, I think like, yeah, no, no, no. And then, but then we collect data, then we collect data and we reject the hypothesis or we cannot reject. So then we have a model which then uh, creates a, our model of how society is supposed to work, right? So we work through the, we walk through the cycle actually uh, this way around. And we can do this glass of red wine theorizing also differently, walking around, uh, around the circle differently, for example. So we verbally uh, deduce uh, some interrelationships from, from verbal statements, uh, and then we, we create a model out of this theory that we just you know, derived, uh, and then and then we just like collect some data, you know, uh, uh, collecting this data. Then afterwards, we formulate our hypothesis, and that's kind of like cheating. But it often happens like nobody would publish a paper saying that that what happened. But it often happens that we then go through it like this, and then at the end we then go back and we walk through the cycle uh, several times. One times this time we first kind of like cheat, look at the data, and then we formulate a hypothesis in order to find that actually what we found was actually yes, what we. You know, we're setting up uh, fake bets where we already know the result of the bet, kind of like, or we intuit it, and then it actually doesn't work. And that, together with with, with many other problems that we had, led to uh, a well-kept uh, dirty secret. It's not so well-kept anymore, but it's pretty, uh, it's pretty frustrating to know, and that is that after 150 years of doing social science, this way and other ways, we found out that half of what we know about society is wrong. And the problem is we don't, we don't really, really know which half uh, of it it is, and that's called the, the replication crisis. So uh, the replication or replication is you, you found something, you, you, you found something, and you say, like, really, okay, that's my scientific finding, that's how these things work together, and then you want to replicate it, you want to do it again, and you don't find the same thing anymore. And we find that Two out of three psychological experiments cannot be reproduced as, as they cannot be uh, reproduced successfully. That means two thirds cannot be reproduced successfully. And out of 1,500 scientists, they fail to reproduce the results from other scientists 70 percent of the time, and for themselves 50 percent of the time. That means you're doing something, you do an experiment, you find something, you publish it, and say, "I think that's how it works." You do it again, you don't find it anymore. So, so what did you? What did you do? 
nothing. You might as well flip a coin, right? You still don't know, is it or is it not? I mean, 50%, you do the same thing again, right? And, and, and that's actually, you know, going, going through the cycle. Somehow this way, there are some problems to it. Feel free to read up on it. We don't have time to talk about the replications per crisis. But it's kind of like, wow, 150 years of social science, and we, we might as, as well have flipped coins. You know, that's really frustrating. And some very high profile victims of that, for example, if you've ever seen the TED talk of, of the power poses, you know, your body language to shape who you are and you do these Superman poses before you go uh, out and, and meet somebody. For example, that has been, has been really debated. Is it? Is it? It could not be replicated half of the time. Sometimes, yes. So there might be something to it. It's not, it's completely, it's not completely wrong, but we don't really know the conditions and we know it doesn't work all the time. So really famous things that you might have seen as well have become victim to this replication crisis uh, and highly, uh, highly debated. So we, we surely, independent of if it works, if it doesn't work, we surely have to do a, a much better job with, with doing social science. Right? That's kind of like the, the challenge that we face. So summing up everything I said here, and that was a big introduction, as I said, well, social science can handle simple, or large problems, but not realistic ones. We, we, society is not simple and society is not large and on averages. Like realistically, we are somewhere uh, in between uh, and we need this third advance uh, of science, as Weaver said. And I also said social science is the most complex of all sciences. It kind of like based on the pyramid of all the other sciences below, which are part of it. Right, which, which kind of like influence it as well. But on top, there's many degrees of freedom, so many degrees of freedom always changing. The stationarity is always changing. It's extremely complex to do social sciences. Right? So if you, do, if you do physics, for example, just to give an example, it's great. The sun was rising yesterday and it, it has been rising for a long time and we can predict that tomorrow it will rise again. Now in social science, it's more like, you know, um, you have in physics, you have the five, forces, for example. Uh, and uh, they also stay the same. That's why the, the sun is rising again, right? So for example, gravity is a force. In social science, it's more like um, we take one of these forces out, like gravity, and we replace it with something completely new. Call it cell phones. Something that wasn't around just, just not so many years back. And you kind of like have to start all over again. Right? So is the sun still rising? Well, I don't know. We have this new force. We got rid of the old one. It's, it's uh, wow, you have to start and start and start. And, and uh, it's, it's really complex. It's quickly changing, many interrelated part. Uh, it's, it's, it's the most complex of, of all sciences. And that's why traditionally we have not been able to make good predictions, but well, we are starting to and getting to that. And we have very pretty bad in reproducing reliable results. So actually, we cannot handle the realistic problems. It's the most complex of all sciences and we are pretty bad at it. So yes, computational social science to the rescue, that's the best bet that we have right now. We put all of that in computers. And we say, well, computers, digital tools help us. Maybe we can get a better grip of doing social science. And that's what we'll go through, the circle that I now introduced in, in, in this segment, uh, we will go through that in this, in this course. So first of all, we have our empirical evidence, we have big data, our digital footprint I already talked about, and that's how you can imagine how it fits into our framework of the class. We have our analytical tools. We will talk about social network analysis, machine learning, natural language processing, artificial intelligence in general, and we have theories. We do computer simulations with that. So basically, that's how we fill it out. Well, we're not going to do red wine. <laughs> But we, like guys, we intuitively always do the, uh, the glass of red wine theorizing. We always do it. I do it. Everybody does it. And what I'm trying to tell you here, this is such a big challenge that everything is welcome. Just sitting there, and this is an amazing computational machine that we have here. Just sitting here reflecting, we often find things intuitively that we couldn't find in any other way. So it's good for you to reflect. You don't need the red wine. That's just, you know, just to give it a name. But it's good for you to reflect and also follow your gut sometimes. I often do that. All of us often do that. So we do enough of that. We won't specifically talk about it in this course because there's no really systematic way you can foster it. Um, but of course, that will also be included and basically uh, close up this circle. Now, uh, how you go about going through the circle, as I said, there might be some better ways and some worse ways to go through the circle. One thing I can assure you for sure, we don't know the best way of doing it. We really don't know. And that's not, we can actually prove that we don't know. 
Uh, and that goes back to a very famous discussion that we have been having in science, maybe one of the most profound ones, and that was be, be, between a mathematician, the most influential mathematician of the 20th century, David Hilbert, David Hilbert, the real Hilbert, you know, <laughs> not like me, like my, my great, great distance uh, uh, academic uh, namesake uh, relative. Uh, and, and David Hilbert, uh, he once asked the question, which is called the Entscheidungsproblem uh, in German. So uh, he once asked the question, are we able to actually automize, automate uh, the process of knowledge creation? Can we kind of like find an algorithm, a procedure, a recipe that we can just rattle through and then create knowledge? Can we do that? We can prove mathematical theorems and all of that just by automating it. You call it this, this Entscheidungsproblem because it's a decision that's called the decision problem. It's German for decision problem. We have to decide when we found the best way of doing this or that thing, right? We have the knowledge of how to do it the best way. And he posed this question in 1928. Very influential question. Then came along this guy here, Kurt Gödel, um, only a few years later, and said he destroyed Hilbert's dream. He, he destroyed Hilbert's dream and said, no, it's not possible. We will never, that's called the incompleteness theorem, we will never ever be able to show that this is the best way of doing things. We don't know if there might not be a better way. That means there's no way we can kind of like optimize finding absolutely the best way of doing things. Uh, and that is proven mathematically. So basically because there always will be paradoxes, inconsistencies, whatever frame of reference you show, that made Gödel uh, the most influential logis logician that we have. And for our purpose, what it shows is I cannot teach you the best way of producing knowledge. And nobody can. So you have this framework, throw at it what you can. Go at it, go through it some ways. Some ways might be better than others. I talked about it some ways. are kind of like, nah, don't, don't. Uh, we have shown that that doesn't lead to very good results. But any other way, creative way, how you can go through this circle uh, is very welcome. And so what computational social science is about, the methods that we have and that we will develop, is just it gives you more variety also of methods, many different ways you can walk through the circle, which is the scientific method that we, that we are revisiting here. And you need many different tools. So you can have one tool, it's so kind of like a tool like a hammer. So you have one scientific method that you pursue and you have this hammer. Well, once you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And you go there hammering and for 150 years, <laughs> going back to the replication crisis, for 150 years you use the hammer and, and everything, you use this hammer and everything looks like a nail, right? But a hammer, one hammer might not always be useful, right? Sometimes reality, she has funny ways of hiding, right? You might need a bomb maybe even an atom bomb, because even after 150 years of hammering, you will not be able to break through, to reveal the truth hidden there, you know, underneath the rocks. And sometimes with a hammer, you might destroy way too much. You might need a feather. You know, you might need a feather of being very careful so you can still see what you need. So what this course is about is to show you some modern hammers and feathers and bombs. You can throw at that. You can throw at that scientific methods that help us to reveal knowledge, always keeping in mind that we don't know what's the best way of producing knowledge.